good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm Jeff Bridgman, pastor at First Presbyterian Church Fullerton, and you're worshiping with us online today. It's September 6th. It's a communion Sunday, so we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together uh, in our homes. And uh, I'm just delighted to be here. I am home, and I have had a bout with illness, and I'm well. Uh, great time away. Uh, when I finally got away, and I'm so thankful, I just need to say here, I'm so thankful for the prayers and support and cards and all the good wishes and all the love that has come from this church. You are a remarkable group of people, and I am blessed to be the recipient of that love. Today, as we come into worship, I want to bring a couple of announcements for you. First of all, as you know, there have been a number of natural disasters going on in our world, uh, people under incredible strength, uh, stress from the uh, Gulf Coast of Louisiana and Texas, uh, where a terrible hurricane has come ashore and flattened St. Charles and other communities in that area to the destruction of much of Beirut through uh, an unfortunate explosion on the docks and, and even through the fires that raged through our own state here in California. All those situations are, need our help. So your GO team, your mission team, has initiated funds that will go to all three of those, to the relief in Beirut, to the uh, care of folks in Louisiana and Texas, and to uh, the rest restoration of communities in here in California due to the wildfires. I just wanted you to know that they've already uh, extended those funds through the funds which you, you give regularly as part of your giving. So your, your regular tithing, we keep telling you how important that is. Well, it actually goes out and is impacting lives today. So uh, I just want to thank you and encourage you. And if you'd like to give to any of those, we're using Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. Uh, you can contact us in the office and we'll, we'll tell you how to do that. Uh, but we're glad to be able to support the needs of people around the world today. Secondly, uh, you have, um, I'm sure you've been trying to keep up with all the COVID news from the governor's uh, changes to uh, the federal government's changes. Well, I, I want to say this is an opportunity for us to pray. Uh, right now, schools are trying to figure out how do we do school? And uh, parents are trying to figure out, how do I, can I send my kids there? What, are, what are, they, are they going to be exposed? What are they going to get? Are they going to sit in nowhere for a day and while they get class? Or, it's just very hard right now. It's very stressful. So I'd like to ask you to pray for the families and the parents, the kids, the teachers and the administrators at our schools, particularly Golden Hill, which is right next to the church. Uh, and pray for our ministries to those families. The Lighthouse Preschool parents are becoming more comfortable about letting their kids come to preschool. And Kids Connection, which has done a total pivot and adapted so that kids who aren't in a classroom on one day will actually be all day at church doing their distance learning because their parents are at work. What a remarkable program is going on in all those cases. I want to ask you to pray for them, to intercede, to help parents make those hard choices and help us be grace to them in all that comes. Will you do that? I know you will. Well, let's step into our worship now. And if you just take a moment and be quiet, just close your eyes and center your heart and be prepared to meet the Lord. Now join me in our call to worship. It comes from Psalm 111, and I'm reading where it's from the New Living Translation. Praise the Lord. I will thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his godly people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them. Everything he does reveals his glory and majesty, his righteousness never fails. Let's worship God as we sing this great hymn of the church, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Oh, 
ago this Sunday actually it was made clear to me that there really was one issue one word that everyone had heard enough of and I shouldn't use that word it was the word change we were told that uh, everyone was weary of hearing oh the world's changing the church needs to change you need to change everything's got to change we have to change well we weathered that time didn't we we got through that season pretty well, I think, and, and we even tried some experiments in worship and in fellowship and in the structure of the church that have made a palatable change. We actually have changed. And I have discerned a change in your attitude, your morale, and even in your faith. And God has been faithful in all that time. And then COVID hit. <sighs> Talk about changes. Can you imagine? I mean, we've changed how we worship, how we greet each other, how we meet together, or if we go out or not, what we, what we wear. We wear masks and we socially distance and we zoom, 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 uh, everybody online. And initially it was also very novel and everyone bent and flexed. And sometimes grudgingly, I admit, but we did things differently than we ever expected we could do them before but we did it. You, you even are celebrating today and have celebrated for months communion in your own home with your own bread and with your own beverage. Would you have imagined doing that even just a year ago? What a remarkable church family you are and how resilient and how adaptable you've become. I have been impressed. Who knew we could change so much and survive well, we have, because truthfully, change is not always a bad thing, is it? Now, this last month, I got to see my two-year-old granddaughter walk down the aisle as a flower girl for my son's wedding just, just a couple weeks ago. And the, the changes in her from the last time that I saw Mia, uh, it, it's wonderful, that growth, the difference in her. 
But you know, when too much change comes all at once, it, it really destabilizes us. It produces a sense of loss and a sense of fear in us. Loss because we lose our security. We lose uh, our sense of what's familiar. We lose any sense of control that we might have had. We Even our identity is challenged. Are we losing our identity, who we thought we were, uh, what's truly important in our lives? And we're forced to decide who we will be next. Church is facing that even today. Fear, the other thing that change produces, is a fear of the unknown. We don't know what's coming out there. Fear of uh, the unknown, fear of this change depresses us. Many of us have gone through a depression during this COVID time. It makes us sad. We grieve the loss of what we had and we want it back. Yet change is a part of the God-designed reality that we all live in. And change only stops when we do when we die. Change is a part of us as long as we're alive, so if nothing changes, you better check your pulse because something's wrong. In the midst of this overwhelming amount of change we had, I thought it was a time to see if we might find better tools for coping with it. Maybe instead of being depressed or feeling like we're stuck, we, we wish things were the way they used to be, God might have something to teach us in all this that changes us. The book of Jeremiah is going to be our guidebook for this time, particularly chapters 27, 28, and 29. So let me give you some background to Jeremiah as before we jump in. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet in the kingdom of Judah, which includes Jerusalem. And you might recall that Israel, the kingdom of Israel that David and Solomon ruled, has was divided into two separate kingdoms. Ten tribes left and formed Israel, and two formed Judah. Israel, uh, at this point in time, is no more. The Assyrians have come and conquered it and wiped it out and carried its people off into exile far away, and it's been resettled by strangers. That's got to be a change for those who were still in the area. And at the time of our text, Judah is no longer a free state. It is a vassal state of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. He has forced them into submission, and he's taken away their king and all their best and brightest people, along with certain valuable items from the temple. It's been crushing. I think it would be like if someone came and carted off the president and his cabinet and the Congress and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Statue of Liberty, plus the angels and the Dodgers, the things that define us, the symbols of who we are, are suddenly gone. Life changed. Who are we now? Well, after a few years under a new established king of Judah, King Zedekiah, this tension has grown, grown between Judah and Babylon. Even the exiles who live in Babylon are, are stirred up. Add to that that there are now some local prophets who are saying that as long as the temple stands, God's going to be with you. God's going to deliver you from Babylon. And soon, God's going to restore all the exiles and all their treasures. God's army would be raised up and defeat the army of King Nebuchadnezzar. God would make Judah great again. That idea has been a common one throughout history. The way it should be would return. Very popular. But Jeremiah's message was not popular. It was very different. See, God wanted to say something different through him. Have you ever been the person who had to bring the different news to the group? One that stood out against the popular belief? It's not easy to be that voice, to tell people what they don't want to hear. You, you risk your place in the community. You risk your position in the company. You, you risk your friendships in the group or family. But that's a prophet's job, first and foremost, to say what God wants his people to hear, no matter how unpopular or contrary it is to current beliefs. That's the call 
that Jeremiah was given throughout his ministry in Judah. You read the whole book, you find him doing this again. He was God's distinctive and unusual contrary voice to the people's wishes, which made him hugely unpopular, you can imagine. God's leaders, the kings, the priests, even turned a deaf ear to him. Right? You go into the Old Testament and read 2 Kings, and you will see how many rulers rejected the prophetic voices that God had sent and did evil in the sight of the Lord. And even when there was a good king, King Josiah, for example, who made sweeping reforms to the faith and life of Judah 30 years before Zedekiah, Judah abandoned those, went back to the way things used to be, worshiping false gods, adopting false values, holding false hopes. <clears throat> so when Jeremiah brings a challenging message of change to them, he uses a very, actually offensive prop to make God's point very clear. And it makes the people uncomfortable. You see why God hadn't quit on Judah. His prophet's word just might make people want to quit on God. The beginning of chapter 27, the message of the Lord came to Jeremiah and it said, make a yoke, fasten it on your neck with leather straps, then send the message to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. Now, all those are other nearby vassal states of Babylon that Judah was actually hoping might join in a rebellion and overthrow Babylon. But this stark message is for them as well as for Judah that they must not rebel, but submit to the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar's rule. Wow. Listen to our text from Jeremiah 27. This Sunday morning, our scripture passage is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 27, verses 12 through 22. Prophet Jeremiah is speaking to the people of Jerusalem after the city of Jerusalem has surrendered to the king of Babylon. At that surrender, most of the gold and silver articles in the palace and in the temple of God were looted and taken away to Babylon. This is God's word for us this morning. Jeremiah is speaking. I gave the same message to Zedekiah, king of Judah. I said, bow your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people and you will live. Why will you and your people die by the sword, famine, and plague with which the Lord has threatened any nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Do not listen to the words of the prophets who say to you, you will not serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying lies to you. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. They are prophesying lies in my name. Therefore, I will banish you and you will perish, both you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Then I said to the priests and all these people, this is what the Lord says. Do not listen to the prophets who say, very soon now the articles from the Lord's house will be brought back from Babylon. They are prophesying lies to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and you will live. Why should this city become a ruin? If they are prophets and have the word of the Lord, let them plead with the Lord Almighty that the furnishings remaining in the house of the Lord and in the palace of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem not be taken to Babylon. For this is what the Lord Almighty says about the pillars, the bronze sea, the movable stands, and the other furnishings that are left in the city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take away when he carried Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, along with all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says about the things that are left in the house of the Lord and in the palace of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem. 
they will be taken to Babylon, and there they will remain until the day I come for them, declares the Lord. Then I will bring them back and restore them to this place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, you probably know that a yoke is a tool used to control animals, uh, beasts of burden, so that they will do what you want them to do and go where you want them to go. And it's usually a wooden or metal frame, a simple cross piece with straps of leather or rope nooses or wooden uh, items that would go under the oxen's neck. And it fastened to a shaft that connected it back to the wagon or whatever the load was that they're going to pull. And everyone knew this was a symbol of hardship. This is a symbol of submission, of servitude, that no free person, no free person in Judah would willingly put on. And yet here's the prophet wearing it and the prophet's message about it. This is God's message. So imagine the response of those who heard it. If you want to live, submit to Nebuchadnezzar's yoke. Well, how could God say that? How, how could they submit even uh, if God asked them to submit? Judah and her king had to face that decision that went against all that they held to be true, all that they hoped for. The temple, it meant security. It said God wouldn't let them perish. The voices of their favorite advisor had reinforced their convictions and their heart desires that God's going to deliver you. Everybody longed for that day when God would pour out his justice on the pagan Babylonians. God had promised to come to their rescue and defeat their enemies. Just look at their history. God always came through. This wasn't what they ever thought they would hear. Jeremiah's message really was preposterous to them, but it was true. Earlier in verses four through six that we didn't read, God has said, with my great strength and powerful arm, I made the earth and all its people and every animal, and I can give these things of mine to anyone I choose. Now, I will give your countries to King Nebuchadnezzar, who is my servant. I have put everything, even the animals, under his control. That had to hurt. Remember, King Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan, and God's saying, this is my guy. This is my choice for the future. This is my Mr. Universe. I think they would be like God saying, China, North Korea, Russia, they're, they're going to be his servant and rule over us. It was that radical, but it came from God. So everybody's saying, who are you going to trust? Jeremiah asked that question. He says to the king, will you submit? Priests, will you surrender the temple and all the precious materials, the gold and silver items? Will you let them be carried away? even though that goes against what you want and what makes you feel secure, will you trust God that he hasn't abandoned you? That he's greater and capable of doing more than you thought? Will you hold on to God over holding on to everything else that makes you secure or at peace? I think that's the challenge that we all face as Christians today. We have to ask ourselves, in the midst of all this change, what's at the core of us? What do we have to hold on to? And that's not a bad thing to do. What gives security in our, to us? Is it our, our faith? Is it our buildings? Is it our music program, our, our worship services? Is it our friends? Is it our memories? What do we need to hold on to? when everything else is changing? It's a question we all have to answer as we come to the communion table today. That's the question of the communion table. 
is the one who laid down his life to buy forgiveness for us, who opened the door to heaven to eternal life, is he more central to hold on to than anything else in your faith, in your faith experience? It's the cost of following Jesus that he raised in Luke 14 when he says, if anyone comes to me but loves his father, mother, wife, children, brother, or sisters, even life more than me, he cannot be my follower. So when we partake of the communion meal in just a few minutes, when we break our bread and when we eat it, and when we pour out the communion wine and drink it, we are answering that question. We are pledging our allegiance. We are saying, Jesus, you matter more than anyone else or anything else in my life. I will follow you even if you choose a Nebuchadnezzar along the way. Following you matters most. In an ever-changing world that seems to take away so much that we have counted on. There is only one person, only one thing to hold on to, and the one who can be counted on, our Lord Jesus Christ. He won't quit on us. He doesn't write people off. He will use all things for his glory. Will you let him use you? Because you are his beloved. So with this communion meal, I invite you to let go of the things that you're afraid of right now. Let go of those fears of the future and how things are and how they may never be again. Surrender to your sense of loss. What have I given up? What won't I ever get back? And proclaim that I will hold on to you, Lord, you alone. And then you will truly come to the table and do this in remembrance of him. He loves you so. Amen. So wherever you choose to celebrate the Lord's Supper, I invite you to prepare your hearts and your minds uh, just like in that meal, these are very ordinary elements, uh, things that we have in our own house that we take uh, by at the grocery store, or maybe you bake your own bread, I don't know. But they're just ordinary pieces, and God uses that ordinary to do extraordinary things in our lives. So as we come to this meal, let me invite you to prepare your hearts. Join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for these ordinary things the elements that are a part of our lives, and now we get to celebrate them together. Though we are distanced apart, our hearts are woven together because of that great love of Christ, because he is the one that we hold on to. He is the one thing that will not change. And so we pray, God, that you will meet us now in this meal. In the name of Jesus, amen. And so the words of institution that come to us from the Apostle Paul prepare us and remind us of this meal. And he said, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread from the table. And when he'd given God thanks, he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body that's broken, that's torn just for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same fashion after supper, Jesus took the cup from the table. And he said, this cup symbolizes a new promise, a new covenant that is poured out for you and sealed in my blood. Drink you all from it. And as often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again, says Paul. And hallelujah, we believe he comes. So if you're a seeker of truth, a seeker of Jesus, ready to make him the one, let me invite you to come now to the table and break off a piece of the bread. This is the body of Christ that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him.
And now take the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you that gives you life so that your blood won't have to be shed. The price is paid and it's sealed in this covenant of his love. Do this in remembrance of him. So it's very appropriate out of this meal that we come with a heart for the world because we have had God's heart, we've consumed it, and now it consumes us. So let's respond to the needs of the world. Um, I will give you a couple of needs that I'm aware of, but maybe there are others, and then I'll, there'll be a time of silence, and you can intercede for family, for friends, for those in difficult situations. Shall we pray? Lord, we begin by giving you praise and glory, for you are the great God, and there is none like you. As we said in our call to worship, your, your works testify of your glory, and we bring you glory and praise again and again. It's out of that position of love and care, out of the assurance that you hear us, that we come with petitions, God, and pray for your power to intercede. Today we Pray for those who stand in need, for Clem St. Louis, who's in hospital. We pray for him and his wife as they uh, try to figure out what's going on in Clem. I pray for your healing touch on him. And Lord, we ask for your continued healing care for Sarah Roca and her family. She's one of our preschool teachers, the assistant director, and her father died suddenly. We pray that you would be the comforter in that time and you would walk through the valley of the shadow of death with Sarah and her mom and her brother and the rest of the family. We thank you for her dad's life and we pray that it will grow richly in his family. Lord, we pray for those who today find themselves isolated and alone, those who are lost, who, who need something and they just don't know what. We pray for those who are stressed and disturbed and depressed now in this COVID time. Draw close to them, Lord, and hear us as we silently lift up the names of people and places for whom uh, we would intercede today. Hear our silent prayers. Lord God, we need your help. We need your help to figure out how we can reconcile people on the issues of race. So much has been said, so much has been lost. We pray, God, that you would move into the hearts and minds of those who are protesting and those who are counter-demonstrating. We ask you, Lord, 
to thwart any plans of violence, any efforts of hate, confuse the mind and the heart of those who would destroy. And may the message of restoration and reconciliation be brought forward. Move us, your church, on that long, hard road with one another, that we might model forgiveness between people and so that men and women might form new bonds. We pray for a more perfect union, which would show us how to repent of past attitudes and behavior, how we might restore community and people's dignity, how we might build a society where everyone can thrive. We pray for the death of those hard and harsh perspectives of how other people are judged and replace it with your vision for human beings. Tear down the dividing wall of hostility. And Lord, we want to intercede for those who grieve today. Particularly, my heart is moved for those in Louisiana, Texas Gulf Coast. The devastation of homes, the loss of hope, power, water, uh, shelter, the basic necessities, the thousands of people working to restore it, and folks struggling. On this day, may your church surround them, and may they be lifted up in prayer, even though they may not know we're, who we are. We intercede for our brothers and sisters in these communities. And Lord, we ask that you would be with those who are working so hard in this recovery effort for the disaster relief people who have left home and family behind to deliver goods, to work on projects, to restore, to those who are uh, on the ground, who live in these communities and, and also have to forego their own family security for restoration. Come Holy Spirit. We pray for those who are here closer to home, who are fighting the natural uh, forces of fire today. For the firefighters still fight, and the aid workers still give aid, and the relief workers still bring relief. Come, Lord God. In those communities that have seen such devastation, we pray that you would lift up eyes to you so that they might find ways to live even though their homes, their community has been burned up. Be the great worker of transformation in these communities. Lord, truly we are blessed for we ha have been given so much. We ask you to help us find ways now to give to bless others. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Let's sing our praise to God. Just one drop would have been enough. It would have been enough. But you gave it all there upon the cross to demonstrate your love. You see. Me before I knew I was lost, and I can't repay you for that cost. Oh, that I am is yours. All of my days I live to worship, my life is not my own. Surrendered, there is no 
great a love There is no great a love Just one touch Would have been enough It would have been enough But you Just one drop would have been enough Just enough was never the point of your love You gave until there was nothing left Now I will worship you with every breath Just one drop would have been enough just enough was never the point of your love You gave until there was nothing left Now I will worship you with every breath All that I am is yours All of my days
Well, we all look forward to that time where we could all be together once again, and we're working hard on getting to the place where we can worship at least in a limited way on campus. Pray for the decisions in that process. There's a lot of things that are not in our control that govern that. But uh, I want to encourage you, uh, while we pray this blessing for one another, that you actually find ways of being that blessing. You take it to heart and consider how you are just where God wants you to be right now. So will you join me in our benediction? And now go in peace and bless the world. And remember, you go nowhere by accident. Where you are going, God is sending you. And where you are, he has placed you. God has a purpose for your life right where you are. Christ Jesus, who indwells you, has something that he wants to do in and through your life right where you are. Believe this and go in his love and in his grace and in his power. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.